Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our ongoing series of webinars that we have on various topics we hope of interest to you. Uh, the one today is a little bit different uh, than uh, we've done in the past, which were really concentrated on enterprise and business architecture. Uh, this one, I believe, will be extremely relevant to uh, all of you uh, listening to us today. Uh, we have gotten more and more evidence that we are moving into a new age, uh, what we refer to as the information age. And this may sound a little subtle right now, but we're moving out of the internet age into the information age. And this is what we believe a very significant thing for us, especially us as enterprise and business architects, because I believe the true understanding of what enterprise architecture and business architecture is will now really come to play here. And so on this first slide that we're showing you, we're showing you basically what we're seeing out there in the quote real world. Uh, this comes from our work with human and organizational behavioralists. This doesn't come from IT obviously. And what it's looking at, and obviously the graph isn't really accurate, is essentially the movement over the years, decades, uh, centuries, possibly millennia uh, for over time. And what you see on this particular chart, uh, it's a kind of a different chart. One is of course kind of easy, it's the time element. And the other one is what's referred to as the basis of wealth. And what this chart is trying to represent, and of course there isn't any uh, high degree of accuracy here, is there is a shift a paradigm shift as that phrase is used, and I really believe it's a true one here, from one age to another where there is a dramatic shift in who's doing what and what is valued by individuals and society in general. So most of us sort of understand that we're moving out of the industrial age into something different. And that difference is causing essentially a drop in comfort level uh, in worth, in wealth, et cetera, et cetera, in the organizations that are out there, and us as individuals. Uh, people that were essentially valued to a certain degree uh, in, uh, you know, a few decades ago um, have, frankly, less of a value uh, uh, from a standpoint of economic value, not personal value, of course, but skills are changing. So, for example, uh, I'm from Detroit. Uh, one of the skills in the industrial age that was, was very prevalent there uh, was in the automobile business, assembly of automobiles. And people were getting paid, for example, $30 an hour to take a tire and put it at the end of an axle, tighten six bolts, and then move forward. A very manual um, a task that is there uh, that takes brawn um, and lesser to agree just a little bit than brain cells. There's a difference. I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but you know, it's a, it's a truism that's there. Now, those jobs aren't been, haven't been outsourced, they're gone. Those particular types of jobs are gone. Well, we're seeing the same thing now in the internet age. And that's because behavioralists tell us that the time it takes to move from one age to another is approximately 40 years. Now, the phrase that used to be used is a lifetime and hopefully our lifetimes are a little bit longer than they were years ago, but basically they're saying there's a shift uh, going on. So what we see that you and I are in right now is what I refer to as the internet age, and we'll be describing that a little bit more, uh, obviously, throughout our, our time together today, and moving to the information age, and this is not a subtlety. There are 12 characteristics that we're going to point out to you in our brief time together today to show you essentially what is going on. Also, which is really pleasing to us, we're seeing people talking about this now in different manners, and I'll try to put all of this together for you to show you exactly what is going on as we shift from the internet age to the information age. The people are changing, the players are changing, the power brokers are changing, the skills are changing. And from an enterprise and business architecture standpoint, we are now going to see what we suggest is true enterprise and business architecture rather than what we've called before EITA, Enterprise Information Technology Architecture, 
I'm not saying it's not important, but it's very, very different than what true enterprise architecture is. So before I get into this, with just a little bit of humor, I have to do something to all of you. Boy, that sounds ominous. So I'm gonna take off my microphone for just a moment and uh, do something here and then we'll come back again. And hopefully you find it entertaining and humorous. Maybe not, but I think you get the point. Well, I think that should have done it. Now, of course, some of you know what that is. That's the Neuralator from Men in Black. And what I'm trying to do here is to just clear your mind a little bit. Uh, hopefully that bit of humor uh, took hold there. <laughs> but I'm not being funny when I'm, I'm being very serious because I do believe that we really have to think a little bit differently about this information age um, that we're now beginning to enter. Please remember the shifts take four plus decades. And we're not out of the internet age yet, but we see more and more evidence that we're leaving the internet age and going into the information age as we move forward. So in my presentation today to you, you'll see a format that looks like this. There's an attribute, that's one of the 12 attributes that we're suggesting you need to look at for yourself and your organization. And we're gonna take you back one age past the internet age, the industrial age, just to give you sort of a foothold uh, into what these things are. So we'll be talking about the industrial age, the internet age, and then the upcoming or entering information age that's there. On page four are the 12 different attributes that we're gonna be talking about. The technology, the icon, what, what is represented out there, the science behind this, yes, there is science. The output, the energy source, so to speak, where is the strength of a person or an organization coming from? What is the basis of wealth in this new area? What is the thing that makes a difference for you as an individual and for your organization? How is work being defined in these various ages? What are you actually doing? What is the organizational form? What is it gonna look like? What is it now and, and, and what is it gonna look like in the future? How are things moved around? The means of logistics, and you'll see this in just a moment. And where is the marketplace? So these are the 12 characteristics we're gonna be working through. Some of them are, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time than others to sort of give you a grounding on what this is. And some of them, of course, will be relatively quick. So let's get started and take a look at this. The first thing we're looking at is the dominant technology. And which I wanna point out here, just to spend a little bit of time, is you'll see the parallels. See the parallels from the ages. There's a lot of people think that the information age and the internet age are something brand new that have never been done before and are completely new. All of the history that we've had as humanity out there is being thrown out. Well, I think you'll see very quickly that that's not the case. So let's spend a little bit of time on this one. In the beginning of the industrial age, what we had was the harnessing of energy to help the individual do things that an individual couldn't do. And what we were using, we were using coal, we were using oil, we were using steam to essentially augment the human, skill, human strength that was there to do things that an individual couldn't do. So we're harnessing essentially energy to allow people to do things they couldn't do uh, on their own. And some of you, have, I'm sure, watch newsreels or movies of the, of the plants that were out there. There were belching smoke and uh, steam was coming out and things like that that was there. And basically what we were doing was harnessing the energy to do things. And what you saw in the beginning of the industrial age was a huge engine. It usually was driven by either uh, coal or oil and it generated steam that essentially took a, a, a paddle or flywheel and made it go around and what was attached to that was belts. They were usually leather belts. 
and these belts were attached to various components in the factory to allow people to do things, um, you know, augment that. And essentially, the decay in energy was due to the length of the belts that were away from the energy source. So you, you were losing essentially energy as things were going along. So what you had, I want to throw some mathematics at it because this is kind of important, you had one engine supporting the whole industrial complex that was there. Mathematics, you had a one-to-many relationship, a relatively simple understanding and uh, activity that was going on. Fast forward in the industrial age to the invention of the electric motor. Radically changed the productivity and the flexibility. Of course, the new word now is agility. The flexibility that you had in the industrial age. So what you had when you had electricity now is you could take these massive engines and break them down into smaller engines and distribute the power to those engines and have essentially a three-dimensional factory or industrial age complex. You weren't constrained anymore by the energy source because you were transmitting the energy through electrons rather than through brute force that was there. From a mathematics standpoint, it was massively different. You now had a many-to-many -many relationship. You geometrically increased the complexity of what was going on. And in the industrial age was essentially the invention of workflow. Because workflow was the key to understand how to essentially route things in a three-dimensional manner in order to make it optimized. And each one of these little units was called a manufacturing cell. That was the industrial age. Now, let's take a look at the internet age for a moment and see the parallels. I'm going to skip a few generations of technology, and I'm going to start with the mainframe. Everybody remember the mainframe, I hope. What you had there, you can sort of see where I'm going. You had one massive engine, one massive engine that was essentially powering the information internet environment. And you and I were attached to that engine by these little thin wires, and we had in front of us, if some of you are of my age or so, a green faded screen that was usually burned in with pixels, and a clickety-clickety keyboard sitting in front of you. It was the IBM 3270 terminal. And we were hardwired connected to that brute big engine out there called a mainframe. Notice the beginning of the Internet age. We had a one-to-many relationship. Let's fast forward, and somebody said, hey, I've got this brilliant idea that nobody has ever thought about in the history of the universe. Why don't we take this big engine and break it into smaller pieces and put it closer to the worker? Hey, that's a great idea. Nobody's ever thought of that. Well, of course they did in the industrial age. And, of course, you and I are sitting probably in front of these uh, marvels right now. Some people call them marvels. Some people have other names for them. But basically you're sitting in front of a personal computer. See the analogy. Now, here's what we forgot. We forgot the complexity. The complexity geometrically increased, and it's called the Internet. Now, if some of you have been following what's going on in the Internet, and I'm sure you have, one of the things that isn't being said explicitly is we have to recognize that the Internet was never engineered. It just evolved. And one of the principles of engineering is if you didn't engineer something, you can't reverse engineer and change it. You're going to go for the philosophy of go for it. You don't know what the unintended consequences are. And whoa, are we finding that out. Software, hardware, passwords ain't going to work, unfortunately, because we have no idea what all the interconnections are because we never architected anything. We just implemented it. Forgive me for being this direct. In the information age, we're moving to something different. It isn't about the distribution. It is about the information classification. 
one of the things that I think most of you recognize is your favorite search engine, whatever it is, Bing, Yahoo, Google, XYZ, QRS, TUV, WXYZ, are generally popularity contests. They are not a classification system. Try to find out what the percentage of the internet is actually searched by Google to give you that information. I think you're going to be shocked when you find that number. It is not a two-digit two -digit percentage. It is astounding. Now, people say to me, well, Sam, I don't care. I don't go past the first page of Google anyways. Well, if you really start recognizing that that first page, and I'm just picking on Google, I'm not picking on Google, excuse me, just using an example, is based on popularity, based on backlinks, based on a whole set of criteria that I'm not here to talk about right now uh, in this particular workshop that's there. It has nothing to do with value. <laughs> it has to do with things that are different. And as things get complex, we start recognizing that classification of information is the key to getting something that is that large and understandable. And one of the prime examples that you see every day, but it's sort of behind the scenes, anybody remember a library? It was the Dewey Decimal System. The Dewey Decimal System was the classification system in the industrial age that allowed people to store and retrieve information. And this is what we have to think about. So in the information age, this classification, how we get at information, we can't do a keyword search on all the possible things out there. There's too much there. We have to start classifying information to start understanding it. It's a whole different set of skills that we're talking about. The icon in the industrial age was the gasoline engine, the brute force thing that's out there that made us go, whether it was gasoline or, or diesel or steam, whatever it is. It was powering the industrial age as we saw it. In the internet, the icon was the microprocessor. That was the key to that particular age, the miniaturization of power, space per bit. <laughs> In other words, it allowed us to pack more and more horsepower in moving bits around and the microprocessor. In the upcoming information age, I've coined the term, and I'm, 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 I'm taking credit for it, not because it may be something that's great or ungreat out there. I don't know what to call it. I'm calling it the info bit. <laughs> it's going to be a unit of power that provides us with a baseline understanding of the worth of this new thing that's out there, the power. I've got 16 info bits. It's just sort of like saying I have 420 horsepower or 110 horsepower or I have a 1.2 uh, uh, gig processor or 1.7 gig processor. Well, it's the same thing in the information age. We'll have seven info bits or 22 info bits per unit of whatever it's going to be. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. It's a different measurement criteria that's there. It's not response time. It's not network up availability. It's something that is different. It is about information, not about just the distribution. The sciences are radically changing. In the industrial age, it was basically mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, civil engineering, those types of things. Phenomenally important things. I'm not discounting any of that. In the internet age, it was computer science. Now, we're seeing an evolution there right now, you and I. In the beginning of the Internet age, we were talking about building computers. Unfortunately, and I say that humbly, right now we're seeing the concentration of a lot of computer science curriculums are on handcrafting programs. That's an Internet industrial age concept. We're falling behind here very quickly. We can't possibly keep up. If we look at the physical world, that's the second level of maturity in an organization. 
what we're going into is ontological science, the ability for you and I to get talents on how to see information, classify it, so you and I and your customer can get at it and use it. It's not that we're discounting any of the technologies. I want to make that clear. But it's a different set of skills, a different set of skills. It's not about implementation. It's about understanding what to implement. What is it? What does it look like? Who cares about it? What is its content? Where do I store it? How do I retrieve it? Ontological sciences. Now, coming back to the Internet age in a moment, we are seeing universities right now recognizing the shift from programming and analysis to something different called architecture. And we are humbled and privileged and proud to be working with a couple of universities on bachelor's and master's degree programs in enterprise architecture. And uh, we're celebrating, I believe, it's five years with these universities uh, Penn State University and Kent State University. And one of our staff members is actually on the faculty of Kent State University, so we're seeing the progress of, of what, is, what is going on. And we can tell you right now that those classes are filled. They are filled. The enterprise architecture classes are filled. They're overflowing uh, with people that's there. People are seeing that the next set of skills are not implementation skills, they're understanding of what to implement. So the science that we're talking about here, we, for, the phrase is ontological science, the classification of information and how to do that in a human consumable manner. Not in a compiler consumable manner, but in a human consumable manner that's there. The output. What are we producing? Mass consumer goods was the industrial age concept. And we all know how that be, has become a worldwide, in quotes, commoditized element that's there. In the Internet age, it was the transmission of data that we were concentrating on. How much stuff can we uh, stuff into a copper line, a fiber line, a satellite link, et cetera, et cetera? How reliable is that? And to be, again, very frank, it didn't matter if the stuff was any good or not, just did you get it to the source that's there. In the information age, this one especially is radically shifting. The output of and the value of information is radically shifting. And we have a young lady that is not an IT professional that we need to thank for this understanding that the key value that you and I will start recognizing and is being recognized by some people out there is information content, not the distribution of data. And that young lady is someone that probably most of you are familiar with, and that young lady's name is Taylor Swift. And not long ago, she wrote a little letter to Tim Cook, as some of you remember. And if you're scanning this article, I'll, I'll give you just a, a, a brief on this thing. Basically, Apple was introducing this new streaming service called Apple Music. And what Taylor Swift did within 24 hours was to get Tim Cook, one of the most powerful IT executives in the world, to recognize perhaps they made a little mistake. And they were valuing, once again, the distribution of information over the information itself. And Taylor Swift said, you know what? I'm not giving you my new album because you guys want to give this to people for free for 90 days. And you know what? As you see in the article here, I'm not worried about protecting myself, but I am worried about protecting those one-hit wonders that have one song that they publish. They don't get any revenues. They have no idea what those possible re re revenues are for a three-month period. Okay? And basically, 
what she's saying in this paragraph is, I realize that Apple is working toward a goal of paid streaming. She's not ignoring that. I think that's beautiful progress. We know how astronomically successful Apple has been, and we know that this incredible company has the money to pay artists and producers for the three-month trial period, even if it's free for the fans trying it out. She's saying explicitly to Mr. Cook, you have to value the information. You have the internet. You have the distribution channel. But without us, you got nothing. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I are going to start recognizing this very, very, very quickly. And I think, as I said, she was the first one to recognize this. Now, very closely on her heels was Adele, another artist, that said the same thing. And she closes her little note out to say, but I say to Apple, with all due respect, it's not too late to change this policy and change the minds of those in the music industry who will be deeply and gravely affected by this. Here's her great last line. We don't ask you for free iPhones. Please don't ask us to provide you with our music for no compensation. It's pretty straightforward. The physical assets were valued. The intellectual capital was not. Thank you, Taylor Swift. I like her. Never met her, of course, that's there. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. The recognition that the shift is occurring from the distribution, what we call the Internet age, to the content, which we're calling the information age that's there. Let's move forward. Next attribute, energy source. Industrial age, fossil fuels. I'm not here to get into a political debate about what is going on. Please, you know, forgive me about that. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's solar, it doesn't matter if it's wind, it doesn't matter if it's nuclear, things like that. The point I'm making here, it was essentially an energy source you know, that we had that was driving the industrial age. The internet was driven through the industrial age by electrons. In other words, again, the distribution agent that was there. And that's what it's working on. Undersea cables, satellites. What is Google about? What is Facebook about? The transmission of information. What is the Internet about? The transmission of information. What is the information age saying? It's the content through the transmission medium that at least has the same value that's there. And the energy source is going to be the mind. Major shift from the physical to the mind situation. Let me take you back once again to Detroit. Whether I like it or not, it is something that I use as an anchor, and hopefully you all understand that, because it was, Detroit was based on an industrial age understanding. At its peak, there were 2.3 million people in Detroit. Now there are approximately 700,000. Oh, my goodness. Well, guess what? That city has the same infrastructure as it did for 2.3 million people with 700,000. The costs are astronomical. The skill set was based on brawn, not brain cells. This is a societal issue. What are we going to do? And people are starting to fret about that. And, of course, one of the things that we always know in, in civilized society is we'll just have government take care of this thing. Well, that's one answer. <laughs> but maybe another answer is figuring out that the information age is about mind brain cells and not about the physical structures, and let's get on it. Let's figure out how to harness those brain cells of those industrial age workers to help them out. As the phrase always overused goes, we need to teach people how to fish rather than just give them fish that's there. It's a different source. Now, just like the other ages that I showed you in the first slide, there are people, unfortunately, that are going to be displaced. 
because either they don't want to or they can't pick up these new skills in this new age. And if we go back to the agricultural age and the, uh, and the mercantile age, some of you, uh, you know, have studied history, know that the French peasants were, were essentially rioting in the streets because they were being disintermediated by the merchants selling their grain and flour and tomatoes and rice and things like that. Well, we have the same situation going on right now. It's going to take some time. But you and I can help our organizations move into this new age by getting the recognition of this new age and helping the organization run better as we move from the industrial age to the internet age and the information age. And that's what I believe an enterprise and business architect really does. It helps the organization move from the industrial age to the internet age to the information age. Enterprise information technology architects, which is what we see most people are doing, are about building systems. This is about understanding how to help the business run better, possibly without touching a line of code that's there. So the energy source. Now this energy source is harder to get than digging a hole in the ground and digging out some coal or transmitting some information or data through a little wire. The energy source, the mind, is something a little bit different. How do we cultivate that? <laughs> You know, this is a whole different thing. We're just beginning to move into the information age that's there. The basis of wealth. The basis of wealth. Industrial age. Very, very clear. Land, labor, and capital. The internet age. Very clear. The distribution system. Please remember, they don't care what's transmitted whoever they are, and you know who they are, whether it's AT&T, whether it's Verizon, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Netflix, all of these Internet age companies are about distribution in general about someone else's thing. Now, we're seeing a shift there. This should be an indicator. What are these companies doing, like Netflix? They're building their own content. Ring, 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 ding, 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 ding. Everybody wake up. <laughs> They're building their own content. They recognize something's going on. And that something going on is going to be the key is what is the information source. Who has the information source? Taylor Swift was the first one to recognize this. That's what I'm mentioning. The information, the information source. But I am thrilled to just a few days ago discover there are some pretty powerful people out there that are echoing what I'm saying here today. And one of those individuals is none other than Tim Berners-Lee. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he was the inventor of the web. It wasn't some vice president that declared he was the <laughs> inventor of the web. And just April 4th in Wired Magazine, Mr. Uh, 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 Tim Berners-Lee received a few days before that uh, the Turing Award, which is the highest award that's out there for essentially um, you know, technology that's out there. If you want to read the Wired Magazine article, it's not very long, it talks about Berners-Lee recognizing a shift. He hasn't dubbed it what I'm dubbing it here, the information age. But what he says right in the middle of the article is a tipping point could be reached where people will realize that the data belongs to me, to them. And if you want it, if you want my address, it's going to cost you six info bits. You want my social security number? That's going to be 10,000 info bits. You want to know my birth date? That's 16 info bits. I'm just, of course, making these numbers up. And it's my stuff. And if you want my stuff, just like Taylor Swift said, and you're the distribution mechanism, you're going to have to give me something a little bit different, you know, that's there. So I am 
tickled pink that someone as prestigious and as powerful as this gentleman is recognizing with a different set of words that we're moving from the internet age to essentially the information age. This is also echoed just yesterday by an article, or excuse me, a, a, news, a news thing from CBS News. Consumers pay for free tax preparation sites with personal data. Let's read that headline again. Consumers pay for free tax preparation sites with personal data. So someone is saying that if you prepare my tax returns, I'm going to, which is worth 86 info bits, I'm going to give you this personal data that's worth the same amount. <laughs> okay. Now, we don't have those equations yet. Okay. Now, why are they doing this? Companies provide free tax filings because of what they can get in return. Access to consumer data, which helps them market services like credit cards and loans, of course. Can you imagine the wealth of information these people get when they're getting your tax return? Oh, my goodness. And, of course, all of you know how secure those environments are. Nobody could possibly get this information. It's impossible. That's a joke, of course, as you know. Now, there is no free lunch. You've heard that phrase a million times. And that's the same with free services. That's always the price you're paying. This is Susan Grant from the Consumer Federation of America. The problem right now, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's all invisible to you, to us. We have no idea because nobody reads those pages and pages and pages of things what you do is you hit the I accept button. Now, if you hit I decline button, you don't get that free stuff. That's what we have to recognize. They're not giving you a choice. What is that telling us? The stuff we're giving them has at least one info bit more worth than what we're getting in return, because that's the way we make money. It's not really clear what information about you is being collected or how it's being used, and I think all of you know that. Um, right now. Okay. What makes a difference as we're approaching this new uh, world here? Economies of scale was the industrial age mantra. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, I'm not here to critique. I'm just here to give you examples. Walmart. What are they facing right now? A whole dis different distribution model. It's not how big the stores are. It's how fast the stuff can get to your front porch. Well, what do we do now? Now, let's look at Amazon. What are they doing now? They say, maybe we should build little stores called bookstores. Oh, my gosh, what's old is new again. Everybody is struggling with this as we move into this new age on how do we get this whole thing moving here. In the Internet age, what made a difference was network dominance and ownership. In the good old days of television, anybody remember television over the air? NBC, ABC, CBS, three distribution networks that had total dominance of what you saw. Now in the Internet age, we have not three, but let's say 20. People say, well, there's 700 channels out there. No, 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 that's the content. Getting it mixed up. Getting it mixed up again. The information is different than the distribution mechanism. Now, some of that ownership and network dominance is converging on purpose. For example, the Walt Disney companies. Walt Disney companies have lots and lots of content. But they also have a couple of distribution channels. <laughs> Uh, they have ABC television, they have ESPN, et cetera, et cetera. Now, they don't have any networks. They don't have the physical yet or don't have that, but they have essentially a broadcast mechanism which goes through another channel that's there. In the information age, what's going to make a difference is intellectual capital. How many units do you have and what is it worth? This is going to be, again, a shift in what's going on. 
And we think it's going to be called something like EIQ is the phrase that we're using, EIQ, Enterprise IQ. And we don't know exactly what that measurement is yet because we're just getting into this. Is it the number of PhDs, the number of patents, the number of whatever? I don't know exactly what it's going to be. But what is it? It's something different. And those players in the Internet age and the industrial age are recognizing this in some form, and they're trying to figure out how to, how to deal with it just like everybody else is. Defining the work. We are coming of age. We as true enterprise and business architects, not information technology architects. That's the Internet age. And when I get, again, I want to stress here, I'm not discounting those people at all, please. And some of you may be those people, which is great. Tremendous skills. We need those skills. But EA and BA is different than EITA and BITA. So industrial age, it was laborers. The Internet age, it was programmers and technologists. The information age, it's architects, ontologists, and knowledge workers. Different set of skills different set of skills that are there. It's not left brain, left, left brain, right brain types of skills. It's a different thinking. It's thinking about what needs to be done rather than implementation. This is extremely exciting to us in the EA field. And we will start recognizing what the industrial age has seen before. So for example, when you're building a physical building, there is, and, and it's, it's complex, let's say a 100-story building. Everyone knows there's two fundamental sets of skills that you need. You need architects and you need implementers. And generally, a massively high percentage of the time, those two skills by design are not in the same company. Because to a general contractor that's building a building, Architecture is an inhibitor to cash flow. <laughs> they want to get through that because there's only just a few architects on the job versus 4,000 people building a 100-story building. So there are professional architecture firms that architect and design the thing to be implemented. And then there are general contractor firms that actually do the implementation. We have yet to recognize that in enterprise architecture to show you where we are in the maturity. And as a matter of fact, in the physical world, the architect is the voice of the customer throughout the build process. They're actually watching what's going on, making the running changes to the architectural understanding as the physical structure is being built. So architecture is not a one-time thing in the physical world, same thing in the industrial and, excuse me, in the information age and somewhat in the internet age, because we're recognizing those skills are different. So EITA, internet age concept, EA, true EA, and BA as we see it, information age concept coming up. Very exciting to us. And we're, start, we're starting to see the true skills of EAs and BAs being recognized, and also recognizing that there has to be a, quote, separation of duties down to the who's doing it level in order to maintain the integrity of what is going on. What are we doing? In the industrial age, we were automating, whatever that was, mechanizing things. Whether it was an ATM machine, whether it was something, you know, a, a, an automobile, we were automating what's going on, whether it's an accounts payable system, a ledger system. In the Internet age, it was about distribution. Just think about how quick this thing has gone through the Internet age. It is now probably frustrating to all of us that we can't make a phone call down the street usually. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. Okay. But basically, if we can get past that, we can generally transmit a bit of data relatively cleanly and relatively quickly. It was about distribution. Even though that's changing 
you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, XG, whatever you want to call it, um, you, know, you know, that's out there. So it was about the distribution mechanism and the power players, whether they were the physical distribution uh, agents or the virtual ones, virtual ones meaning like Facebook and Google. They don't have the distribution mechanism there, although Google is laying their own fiber, as you know. Notice how all of this is, is, is gelling. But when we get into the information age, the key thing that they're doing there is informing. And I wish I could tell you what the me measurement is right now. Is the number of PowerPoint slides we produce in a day? I don't know. <laughs> That's supposed to be a joke, by the way. It's going to be something different. But the value is on the information worth. And that's what we're doing. We're producing information for our customers. That's really what we're talking about in the information age. Organizational form. Oh, boy. This is a big one. This is a big one. Most of your organizations, and again, I don't have the privilege of knowing all of you by any means, have a hierarchical organization structure, whether it's a commercial sector or the government sector, private public sector, there's generally somebody up there that is the head of the organization, enterprise, whatever it is. And below that, there's a pyramid structure underneath that. That's what we see. So you have the CEO or the managing director or the secretary for government agencies, and then you have a taxonomical structure underneath that. As I say to people with a smile on my face, it sort of tells you the salary grades of what salary grades that, uh, of what people are. It doesn't necessarily suggest the intelligence or the skills. I'm not saying those people on top aren't intelligent. That's not what I said. All it tells us is the relative pay grade that's going on there. Industrial age concept. More about this in just a moment. In the internet age, we called it we called it was a network enterprise, and that caused us some issues because we didn't recognize we organizations didn't recognize the shift. In the industrial age, again we had a hierarchical organization, and it was called command and control, command and control, command and control that was there. In the internet age. We had a networked enterprise, not physical network, but the network was essentially horizontal. And the horizontal thing that we had there, we called essentially collaborate and communicate. Collaborate and communicate. Sideways types of information flow. Hierarchical industrial age. Internet age, collaborate and communicate. In the information age, we're dubbing it cooperatively optimized. There isn't a structure based on years of service or political expediency, we believe. It will be essentially a more fluid type of concept where we have a situation where skills are recognized and optimization occurs on a problem, a project or program or opportunity basis. Now, this is already happening, and it happened years ago. They were called skunk works. They were called brain trusts. There was all sorts of things that were going on there. I think it's going to become more formal. I know it's going to become more formal because we're seeing it right now. But the effects of these are sort of haunting us a little bit right now. Where did the hierarchical enterprise come from? It came from the ancient Chinese military treatise called The Art of War by Sun Tzu, 5th century BC. And if you essentially read the text here, it's 13 chapters of understanding of how to build a command and control structure. And this essentially treatise had influence on an incredible number of things that were out there. Business tactics, strategies, military thinking, and your organization structure. 
perhaps it's time for a little change. And that's what moved us into the Internet age, which unfortunately we collectively didn't study. And that's what we suggest caused this gentleman to be able to do what he was able to do. Because no longer did information flow from the top down in a controlled manner, we were in a collaborate and communicate structure, and that's how Mr. Snowden was able to get at this stuff. There was, it doesn't matter how many passwords you have. It doesn't matter if you lock up your USB port uh, on your computer. It doesn't matter if you eliminate your DVD drive. It's the recognition that the age and how things are distributed are different. And if you look at his background that I gave you a little bit of understanding, man, in 2013, Mr. Snowden was hired by an NSA contractor, Booz Allen Hamilton. This is not a corner store type of operation. These are, this is one of the most prestigious organizations in the world. And I'm sure they got massive screenings in front of them. And before that, he was employed by Dell and the CIA. Oh, my goodness. And then with a few months after he got essentially to Booz Allen, he was able to essentially penetrate that whole infrastructure that quickly. In May, he left. In June, everything started spilling out. That's how quick things are out there. And I'm suggesting, I'm not pointing at an individual because I can't, it's looking and understanding that the world of organization and information flow has radically changed. And passwords and encryption <laughs> ain't going to do the job. It's different. It's different. We see this. If you don't believe me, just look around. <laughs> so we have to recognize that information doesn't flow top down. It just flows, and we have to get an understanding of how to address that in the information age. And why do I keep calling it the information age? It's the recognition it is the information age, and it's not the Internet age. We have to actually start talking about both of those. Because what we're spending our time on in most enterprises is locking up the Internet access. No! <laughs> That'll help, by the way. But we don't know how many access points there are. It's sort of like your house. You sort of know how many access points there are. Can you imagine just for a moment saying, well, we don't need any walls. We don't need any doors. We'll just put a sign up and say, please enter here. <laughs> okay. Oh, that'll be helpful. That's really what we're doing in the Internet age right now, saying, please enter this way because we know how to control that. But we don't even realize there's a wall over there that has a hole in it that you can get through. Love it. You and I, as enterprise and business architects, will be able, I believe, to understand this. Means of logistics. Industrial age. Plane, trains, and automobiles. One of the greatest movies of all time. No. <laughs> Airlines, trains, ships, and trucks. Internet age. Obviously, the network. No doubt about that, that was out there. What's the means of logistics in the information age? I believe there will be disintermediation of the network. And there is nervousness about those network providers right now. It's going to be source to customer. Source to customer. Let's think about Amazon for a moment. Mr. Bezos is now the second wealthiest person in the world. I'm not. <laughs> Must be doing something right. I don't think he's up late at night uh, worrying about his wealth. But I do think he's a pretty bright person. I'm sure he is. I've never had the pleasure of meeting him, of course. But he's got to start thinking about being disintermediated. Because what is Amazon? If you look at the statistics, they're a distribution source. They're an access point. So instead of me buying a um, um, uh, Kraft macaroni and cheese or a, um, uh, a uh, uh, attic fan or a hammer 
through Amazon, why shouldn't I be able to go directly to Stanley to buy a hammer, for example? Cut out the middle person, and that's been going on for centuries. Why can't I go directly to Kraft and get my macaroni and cheese or whatever I want to do there? Think about the information age and who controls that source. And finally, where is the marketplace? And the marketplace, shopping malls. We have a client that is one of the major shopping mall developers in the world. They're sweating a little bit right now. They're nervous a little bit right now, and of course, trying to address it. Mall traffic is down over 50% from its peak. What are you going to do? Interesting question, really strategic question. Well, one, one thing you can do is knock it down. That's, that's, that, that'll work. <laughs> the other thing you can do is start to leverage that environment that's out there. Where's the marketplace? The internet cyberspace. Once again, the distribution of bits through wires. Now, by the way, when I say wires, it doesn't have to be wired, it could be wireless. Information age. Hyperspace, peer-to-peer, -peer, you and I exchanging information. I'll give you six info bits for this information, and you give me six info bits for this information that's there. Okay? Or out of the sky, airdropping, whether it's pizzas uh, through Domino's and their, uh, their um, drones, or whether it's literally airdrops that are out there. We're disintermediating the power brokers of the Internet age. So in summary, in this very short period of time, I've tried to give you a taste for the 12 characteristics, and there's a tremendous amount of detail we can talk about, obviously, on each one of these, and how it affects you and I. But I believe that a true enterprise architect a true business architect is now coming of age once we recognize that we're moving out of the internet age into the information age. And I'm really excited about this. Really, really excited about this. Because I think we are going to have an impact on organizations because we can help the organization move from the industrial age to the internet age to the information age. I want to leave you with this paraphrase that is attributed to, I would say a quote, it's not a direct quote, to Indira Gandhi's, excuse me, Gandhi's <laughs> grandmother. And the paraphrase goes something like this. When you go out in the real world, meaning at the end of this session in about a minute or so, you'll find three types of people out there. Those that do the work, those that talk about doing the work, and those that take the credit. I suggest that you get in the first group because there's less competition. <laughs> Please go out there, do some business architecture, do some enterprise architecture, help your organizations moving forward. Your value is just coming into being out there. And of course, we are here to help you, whether it's through consulting or training or education or mentoring, move forward in enterprise and business architectures. I thank you for your attention, and you'll probably get an email from us on our upcoming uh, uh, webinars also. We've got lots of them coming up. One of the most exciting ones coming up essentially is client-focused ones where we're actually going to have some of our clients present what, we're, what they're doing in enterprise and business architecture. Nothing like real world experience. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, depending what your time zone is. Again, thank you very much for your attention. Have a good day.